As Samantha Nicholson feeds her five-month-old Lila, she can't help but think about the cost of formula. It's constantly on her mind. Laying awake in bed wondering if you're going to be able to feed your kid is just, it's a gross feeling. It's very not nice and it's just something that feels very out of your control. Nicholson and her husband Adam have three children under the age of four. All were fed with formula. Since having their first baby, the price of this liquid gold has skyrocketed. Now it's $43.99 for the same amount that in 2021 I was paying $28.99. Shadia Foster has experienced a similar level of shock with her Lila. It was just really disheartening to see the high cost and the lack of variety in different formulas. She says in the last two months, cheaper store brand formula has been nearly impossible to find. And Foster often speaks to other parents who simply can't afford what's left. There are women who are saying they'll drive anywhere to get coupons. We shouldn't have to do that. You know, we should be able to easily go out and buy formula that's affordable and feed our babies. At the North Grove and Dartmouth, staff have also witnessed a surge in desperation. The centre offers resources including food for families in need. One of the most popular requests? Formula. I would say of every seven parents who come in asking for it, we're able to provide for one. Wendy Fraser says many parents choose not to eat themselves or stretch their formula supply to make it last longer. This family physician has also talked to patients who water it down. It's a concern because the, the actual formula will lose its nutritional value. It's, it's, it's supposed to be made in a certain way uh, to be prepared, obviously. If you water it down, uh, you're going to lose some of that nutritional value and, and that's going to adversely affect the health of the baby as well. The North Grove is one of several organizations that received provincial money last week to help pay for nutritional programs. But while Fraser says it will certainly help, a longer term plan is needed to address the growing overall food crisis. Angela McIver, CBC News, Dartmouth. As healthcare workers report high levels of burnout, many say childcare with flexible hours would help them stay at work. It's still an open question whether around-the-clock daycare for children of health care workers is feasible, but at least two provinces, including Nova Scotia, are trying to find out. Shana Luck reports. Supper time at this Cape Breton daycare. Their little beds are waiting next door. One last chance for mom to spend time with her girl before heading to work to teach piano in the evening. She eats here, she loves to dance to music, and they even got her to sleep. This 24-hour daycare next door to the hospital now serves at least 22 families like the Chows. Her husband is an ER doctor on a rotating shift. Both of our families are in Ontario, so we don't have like grandparents close, close by to just, you know, drop off the baby occasionally. The Night Owl program began in January, a pilot program for the children of health care workers funded by the province. I think it just shows them that we are serious about the need we have for um, healthcare professionals in the area. It's an idea also being explored in Newfoundland and Labrador, where the nurses union surveyed thousands of healthcare workers who said childcare is a top issue. If they had childcare, it would prevent them from um, resigning from their permanent position. Newfoundland and Labrador says it's planning to fund 180 daycare spots for health care workers with the eventual goal of 24-7 service. Both provinces still need to analyze if the idea is sustainable. An American hospital network with a decades-old program says they don't do overnight, but the day service is working for them. comes close to paying for itself, but right now um, we do spend a couple million dollars a year on subsidization of these programs because we think they're so important. So far in Sydney, Nova Scotia, only two children have stayed the entire night. Still, the daycare owner believes this model will work. Eventually it will. It will be viable. Since this is a first for Nova Scotia, the province will do a full evaluation in the spring to determine if any adjustments need to be made to the program. Shana Luck, CBC News, Sydney. It will be at least another two weeks before the province's largest hospital has properly working sprinklers. The Nova Scotia Health Authority says things have mostly returned to normal after back-to-back -back water main breaks two weeks ago. But pressure is still not back up to standard for the sprinkler systems at the Halifax Infirmary, the Abbey Lane and Camp Hill Veterans Hospital. 
NSHA says the water pressure problem has also affected air ambulance service to the Halifax Infirmary. The helipad cannot be used without proper fire suppression in place. Life flight helicopters are using the landing pad in Point Pleasant Park and ambulances are transferring patients to the hospital. The first long-term care home in the First Nations community in this province will soon open in Eskasoni. It's been a dream for many in the community and today many came together to celebrate the facility. The CBC's Kyle Moore was there. For nine years, Mary Gugu's mother has been living in a guest home in Sydney. The 50-year-old lives with familial spastic paraplegia, which impacts mobility and muscle control. There hasn't really been too much of Mi'kmaq traditions or culture for her, such as powwows or anything like that. So it's been really difficult on her. She's been disconnected from that. But that will soon change with this brand new state-of-the-art long-term care facility. The facility is named Gignu, which means our home in Mi'kmaq, and will soon be home to Gugu's mother, Tabitha. Oh, it's just going to be so emotional, I know for sure, but there's going to be so many happy tears to see her come in. And I know she was so excited when I told her about it back in November, is when I got the call for her transfer to start it. As Kazoni elders helped with the design and plans of the building, the foyer includes seven large poles representing Mi'kmaq districts and the seven Mi'kmaq sacred teachings. The 48-room facility is the first of its kind in a First Nations community in Nova Scotia. We have uh, high esteem for our elders in, in our tribes and our cultures uh, across the land. And, and one of the things that we want to really embrace and really cherish is to take care of our elders. Our elders, you know, they're the language keepers, they're the, they're the knowledge keepers. The new home is owned by Eskazoni, which partnered with long-term care provider Shanax. The home is also providing jobs for the people of Eskazoni and surrounding communities. We indigenized it. We have majority, 98% working here from, from the community. They're Mi'kmaq speakers. You know, language is uh, and rooted everywhere on the, uh, on the building here. It's beautiful. It's there. It's their home. It's, it's our home. Residents are scheduled to begin moving in April 23rd. Kyle Moore, CBC News, Eskazoni. An industrial accident in Halifax this morning saw one person rush to hospital and a construction site shut down. It happened on the corner of Roby and Kennard Streets. Firefighters and paramedics had to scramble into a deep pit at the center of the site to recover the worker. There's no word on his condition. The Provincial Labour Department has imposed a stop work order on the entire operation while it tries to determine what went wrong. There are developments tonight in the ongoing effort to shut down unauthorized baby eel or elver fishing in Nova Scotia. Charges have been laid after a provincial conservation officer was allegedly struck by a vehicle during an enforcement operation. The incident took place not on a remote rural stream, but in the heart of HRM. Paul Withers reports. It happened one week ago tonight here at the Shubenacadie Canal in downtown Dartmouth where elvers can be caught. Police were called by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. They say a 39-year-old man has been charged with assaulting a conservation officer and will appear in court later. Police have not identified the accused. That was what I assumed it was. It was like somebody was trying to rob me from my vehicle, right? James Nevin, a member of the Sabaganakity First Nation, says he was the one arrested by Halifax police. During a protest the day after the incident, he claimed he did nothing wrong. Conservation officers did not identify themselves and he was sprayed with bear spray. He just opened up his back door and he says, you're coming with me. I said, for what? What did I do? He said, uh, assault, assault to a PO uh, with, a, with a weapon. I said, I have no weapons on me. He says, no, with your truck. The DNR officer said that you hit, him with, you hit him with your truck. I said, I didn't hit nobody. Like him, many Mi'kmaq claim a treaty right to fish for a moderate living means they don't have to obey DFO orders. The Supreme Court of Canada says otherwise. It's ruled the federal government has the authority to regulate treaty fisheries for conservation and other purposes. Fisheries and Ocean says in Dartmouth, three people were arrested and released at the scene, and 2.8 kilos of elvers were put back in the water. In a separate bus last week, DFO arrested five people in Yarmouth County, seized a vehicle, and released one and a half kilos of elvers. 
The department says so far this year it has made 91 ELVER-related arrests. The Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources and Renewables tells us its officers will continue to back up DFO. Paul Withers, CBC News, Dartmouth. There will be no bear hunt this spring in Nova Scotia. The province says 17,000 Nova Scotians were surveyed about the hunt. 51% were opposed, 47% were in support, and 2% were neutral. But Sally Cunningham of Safari Club International says a spring hunt run as a pilot project would have given the province more information about the pros and cons of a regular spring hunt. They were worried about having the right information to know whether or not it was a feasible hunt. And in order to conduct a pilot project, the information that would be collected from that would essentially be a study to say, okay, yes, we can support this, or no, we can't. Moving forward, had they done the pilot, they would have seen the numbers would be supportive of this, and they would have known that, yes, this is something that is feasible. I'll talk to Sally Cunningham of Safari Club International about the bear population in Nova Scotia and her reaction to the government's decision to not allow a spring hunt. That is our Newsmaker interview just after 6.30. But right now, let's talk weather. Ryan Snodden with us now from the Weather Center. Pretty quiet day out there. Yeah, quiet. Couple of showers kicking around and you know, definitely a variable day in terms of temperatures, which I know so many spring days are. But today uh, was definitely one of those days. You can see northerly winds keeping temperatures into the mid. Uh, the low to mid single digits, or I should say mid to high. I mean, Shetta Camp 5, one of our coldest spots, but it was as chilly as three or four degrees right along parts of the coast. Uh, but generally, yes, mid to high single digits here and a couple of double digits and a Ganesh. And then down here in the south and west, this is where we we're climbing into the more widespread double digits and teens. And it's a pretty similar setup again for tomorrow. You can see the clouds have been more dominant across the east as well. A few showers kicking around, maybe even a few flakes mixing in over the highlands of Cape Breton. And as we look into the uh, wider view, Still watching this system, which is spinning just east of Newfoundland. That will bring, yes, some 5 to 10 to 15 centimeter amounts of snowfall to Newfoundland tonight into tomorrow. For us, though, it's just going to re basically reinforce that northerly wind and keep us a little on the cool side again for tomorrow. Area of high pressure sliding in, though, will keep the sun in the mix. The system moving into the Great Lakes. That's what we're watching for the weekend, Saturday in particular. Uh, here is how things are going to play out for tomorrow. No temperatures again, mid to high single digits again in the northeast. Isolated shower chances early on tomorrow before 9 a.m. And then it looks like those will wrap up. Looking at some gusts to 50 and 60 in the east tomorrow. Lighter winds in the west and a little more sun and obviously some milder temperatures as well. I mentioned that system moving in for the weekend and yes, it will. Uh, but the good news is that it's a pretty quick mover and you can see Friday also looks like a great day here. There's that line of rain that's going to be working its way in just in time for Saturday, but it will clear. Sunday's looking better. Your seven day forecast and all the details are still to come. Tom and Amy. Ears perked up there for sure. <laughs> better, yeah. Okay, yes. Ryan, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, Nova Scotia will get money for housing and for defense spending in the federal budget. The CBC's Brett Ruskin breaks down where exactly some of that money is going. Two items in the budget on display here in one location. So let's start on this side. See that blue greenish sign there? That is the sign for the entrance to Shannon Park. Now, Shannon Park was formerly a military facility where Canadian Armed Forces families used to live in, in barracks and housing there. Those facilities, those old buildings have since been torn down. So there's been talk about what to do with this site very close and within kind of the urban center of Halifax. There was talk of building a CFL stadium there at one point, but that's not what this city's center and what many city centers across the country need. They need housing. Housing was one of the main themes, main topics in the federal budget announced yesterday. And so this is one example, as along with many others across the country, of federal land, in this case, Department of National Defense land, that will be used for housing. So investments being made here to create modular, house, modular housing at Shannon Park. Now, on the other side of things, we also have the building across the harbor there, the Halifax shipyard. That is where the Arctic and offshore patrol ships are being built, where the Canadian surface combatant ships are being built. So significant investments in the future 
class of warships for Canada in response to the many ongoing conflicts around the world. There is also new investment coming for the life extending the extension work for the existing Halifax class frigates. So those are the ships that Canada has been sending to uh, Operation Reassurance, which was in response to the initial annexation of Crimea, as well as the more recent conflicts between uh, Ukraine and Russia, to as a show of solidarity with NATO allies. So sending warships there with this new investment of $1.9 billion at least for this life extension program, possibly an additional $8 billion for work to keep uh, work here at home to invest in these assets so they can be sent abroad to assist Canada's allies overseas. So two examples of items in the budget here in one location. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. The federal government is also selling the historic century-old armory in Amherst to make way for new housing construction. The goal is to build close to 4 million new homes by 2031. And to help accomplish that, the Defense Department will be divesting 14 surplus properties. The Amherst Armory was built in 1915. It was declared surplus in 2016 after the local reserve unit moved out. It is still used for community functions, military cadet training, and to house the North Nova Scotia Highlanders Regimental Museum. Meanwhile, the provincial government says it is mostly pleased with the federal budget. Finance Minister Alan McMaster says he's particularly glad to see Ottawa put even more money on the table for infrastructure projects. He says Nova Scotia's share should allow much needed work to go ahead. I would say the fact that there's, you know, 100, you know, 150, maybe 180 million for Nova Scotia in terms of infrastructure, that, that's money that can be well invested in our province. And, um, yeah, maybe there needs to be more, but right now it's it's good to see that there's something in the federal budget for infrastructure because it's it's money that has lasting benefit. McMaster is less impressed with the amount of money Ottawa is proposing for a national school food program. He estimates Nova Scotia's share at about $6 million, about one-third the amount of money the Houston government has budgeted to start the program next fall. A new Canadian warship built in Halifax has a new home. Yes, HMCS Max Bernays has arrived in its home port in British Columbia after completing a long journey. It's been a tremendous amount of work to get us to this point and it's been a phenomenal experience for our combined East and West Coast crew. The Defence Department says the vessel is now in Esquimalt. The Arctic and offshore patrol ship is the first Harry DeWolf class vessel to permanently join the Royal Canadian Navy's Pacific Fleet. Built by Irving Shipbuilding in Halifax, the ship was launched in October of 2021 and traveled through the Panama Canal and up to BC where family and friends greeted her. First quick break on the way, stay with us. There's a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. A whistleblower is testifying in front of a U.S. Congressional Committee about the safety of planes manufactured by Boeing. One year ago today, about $20 million in gold was stolen from Toronto's Pearson Airport. Today, Ontario police announced arrests related to the largest gold heist in Canadian history. Well, speaking of gold, maybe there's <laughs> a pot of it at the end of this rainbow nice? captured by camera operator Patrick Callahan yesterday in Halifax. Ryan is up next with his weather forecast. We'll see you in just a few minutes.
All right, saw so a few people out today doing their yard work. Oh, Honestly, yeah. I swear you can see the grass growing. It almost. is it's growing. So it's green not out uh, there. hot yet, but you know no. there is spring is sprung. It's true. <laughs> and uh, yeah, listen, I've been guilty myself of uh, yeah, definitely taking just a few minutes here and there to rake the lawn because mm -hmm. it has been like a bog for so long yeah, that's true. that now it's dry enough. You feel like you can kind of do a little bit of raking <laughs> here and there. Um, and yeah, we are going to be looking at some wet weather tracking back in for Saturday. Tom, again, wants okay. to put off that yard work as <laughs> long as he possibly I can. can. Myself from yard Sunday, work? it sounds like Sunday, Sunday. right? Okay, stuff. Sunday's your day. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Another pressure's on. Okay, <laughs> that's right. Have a look at our uh, uh, viewer, or sorry, our webcam uh, shot uh, from Nova Scotia webcams. Uh, and a nice scene this evening in Iona. This is, of course, Highland Park Village. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful mm -hmm. there. Seven degrees, still a little on the cloudy side. We have been looking at a couple of those showers kicking around uh, for the eastern parts of the mainland and into Cape Breton. Temperatures, yeah, just two in Shetta Camp right now. Um, we still are hanging on to the double digits uh, down in Shelburne, uh, but uh, overall, and Kedgy as well. Most of us, though, have uh, cooled off mid to high single digits, kind of widespread out there. That northerly wind. It's been a little bit of a factor today, no question about it, making things feel a bit cooler and yeah, keeping those temperatures cool in the north and east. Sustained in the 20 range, uh, 26 as you can see in Caribou Point there. And we are looking at those uh, uh, gusts upwards of 30, Greenwood and most notably across Cape Breton. The winds are actually going to be picking up a little bit in intensity for Cape Breton and back as far east as say Anaganish County and Guysboro County for tomorrow. Uh, it's where we're going to be seeing some stronger gusts in the 50, maybe even 60 kilometer per hour range. And it's all thanks to this low, which normally would be moving off to the east, but that blocking high says, no, 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 you're staying there. So it is going to be moving up towards Newfoundland, wrapping in the cold air, and we've got five to 10 to 15, maybe even 20 centimeters of slushy snow going to fall in the interior parts of Newfoundland. By the time we get to Friday morning, yeah. Uh, so for us, we're going to be, again, feeling the northerly winds, but high pressure moving in. This is the system we're going to be watching uh, that's eventually going to make its way in for the weekend. Temperatures across the country right now, certainly cooler in the prairies, but uh, Vancouver at 12. And you can see that warmer air where the jet is uh, parked here, basically across the middle part of the continent. Cooler to the, to the north, and yes, that uh, hot, hot heat building off to the south. It'll spring northward eventually. As you can see, temperatures tonight will be anywhere from one to three degrees. Northerly winds sustain near 20 and gusting upwards of 30. Even through the overnight, we'll see some of those gusts, uh, but for the most part, it will be uh, an easing wind into tomorrow morning. And then uh, we'll be watching uh, the exception there being Cape Breton, where it looks like tonight, most of tonight will be 30 gusting 40 to 50 kilometers per hour and even into Anaganish and Guysboro County. So there's tomorrow morning. Pretty sunny start again for the West and you folks in this setup always do best in terms of the clouds and the temperatures into the double digits by lunchtime for the Tri-County area and into Kedgie and the clouds should break way for some sun into the afternoon, but it looks like for the most part the clouds will be a little more dominant than not in through Cape Breton and through the Northumberland shore. An isolated chance of a shower early on tomorrow. Temperatures really variable. Three in onshore winds in Inverness could squeak into the double digits again. Richmond County in through the St. Peter's area. Uh, gusts 50 to 60 as we said. Coastal gusts strongest for Cape Breton. Gusting to 40, maybe 50 for Anaganish and Guysboro tomorrow. Uh, we'll see those isolated shower chances along the Northumberland shore. Uh, six to nine to even 10 degrees through the Fundy and Valley region. The winds layer here, just 10 to 20. 20. And yes, uh, that will help temperatures bump up into the double digits. We'll be near double digits in through the Halifax area as well. It looks like we'll be right around the 10 degree mark and we're going to be seeing temperatures near 12 uh, for Halifax on Friday. And again, still coolish in the north and east. There's that area of high pressure moving out. There is the next system moving in and again showers for New Brunswick, but it looks like that line will get a little shot in the arm as it comes through with some periods of rain, maybe 5 to 15, maybe 20 millimeters potentially from that line coming in on Saturday. Clearing skies through from west to east through Sunday morning. So by Sunday afternoon, Tom will be raking his yard, <laughs> trimming his hedges, uh, really least, working hard. Should we help him, do you think? Well, yeah. I already picked the sticks up. I gotta let you know that. So I've started a little bit. A little bit, nice. one at a time. All right, thanks so much, Ryan. Thank, Thank you, you, Ryan. Well, up next, there will be no spring bear hunt in Nova Scotia. We'll talk to a hunter who's not too happy about the government's recent decision on this. That's our Newsmaker interview. Stay with us. You are watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
There will be no bear hunt this spring in Nova Scotia. The province says 17,000 Nova Scotians were surveyed about the hunt. 51% were opposed, 47% were in support, and 2% were neutral. The annual fall bear hunt will remain. Sally Cunningham is with the Safari Club International Hunters Advocacy Group and was in favor of a spring bear hunt in this province. Ms. Cunningham, what do you think of the government's decision to not go ahead with that hunt? I mean, I'm incredibly disappointed in the outcome of the survey and that they took that to heart when it was boiling down to emotional responses versus the scientific ones. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, when you look at the results of the survey, a lot of it indicated that they were worried about the conservation of bears. And when you look at hunters, hunters are actually the number one contributors to conservation in the world. So it seems like an ironic statement that they think that we're going to hurt something that we want to protect. It, hunters, property owners and farmers, according to the survey, seem to be you know, more in favor of a spring hunt than, than others uh, in, in, the, in the survey group. What does that tell you? That they are having the most run-ins with them during the springtime. Because, I mean, you're going to have a lot of people on the peninsula that don't have those run-ins. So I think that's why you're seeing more of a response from that area. You, you've you been thinking that a, a spring hunt as a, a sort of pilot project would be a good thing. Why do you say that? Well, I mean... They were worried about having the right information to know whether or not it was a feasible hunt. And in order to conduct a pilot project, the information that would be collected from that would essentially be a study to say, okay, yes, we can support this, or no, we can't. Moving forward, had they done the pilot, they would have seen the numbers would be supportive of this, and they would have known that, yes, this is something that is feasible. To ax it now is denying the information they need in order to move it forward. Well, I guess there's no telling what what the true data is out there. If we haven't, if there, there doesn't seem to be much study because the government's saying there needs to be more research about the bear population. Yeah. It aims to do that. So, I'm from your point of view, what data is missing? Do you think? Well, I mean, in fairness, there has been studies conducted throughout Canada, and studies as far back as 2019 indicated that we had populations in Nova Scotia alone that were between 150 to 200 bears per thousand square kilometers. So when you do the simple math on that, if Nova Scotia is 55,000 square kilometers, that means that we should have a robust population of over 10,000. And when you look at the studies of how many bears were taken in previous years leading up to this one, we're harvesting less than a thousand of those a year. So by the math, you should be able to conclude that there is enough of a population to support that spring hunt. So the fall hunt continues. Um, so the population, I guess, is reduced to some degree, at least then. But what, what, sure. what are you hearing about um, how much of a nuisance bears are in general? Well, you're seeing more people have run-ins with them, and it was less in previous years. And I know that DNR doesn't want to admit to this, but their nuisance calls have gone up. And in past years, back around 2015 and so on, we believe that the nuisance calls were somewhere in the way of, I think, 750-ish. So if they're having to dispatch that amount of bears for these calls, why wouldn't it have been a suitable solution to allow hunters who are willing to pay for these tags and willing to put the work in and not waste the meat and protein that can be harvested from these animals in a springtime scenario and save all of that, all those nuisance animals? Because when an animal is taken through nuisance, nothing is done with the protein. And I mean, if you look at what's happening to us now and the cost of food, we're going up, what, 11% a year? So people can't afford to eat. So why would you eliminate something that you can get so much protein from that is beneficial to the population? Well, I when think you look they, at they, ourselves. Yeah, they say, they say they're doing it because, they say they're doing it because it wasn't conclusive that people, that a majority of people, or at least, or the, the survey shows that there was a lot of people didn't want this and that they claim to feel there isn't even enough information about that bear population. I think that they're not reading. I think that they need to look into it further. And again, as we said, 
the pilot project should have given them the information. They're making a decision without data, it seems, if they're basing it on the emotional response of a survey that was conducted. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like, why, why are they taking the views of some of the letters that were sent in on such organizations or such individuals that may not have a background in how things are conducted and may not understand how populations work or are simply just animal lovers, and that's fair. Everybody has their right to have an opinion on that. But when we're talking about a conservation of a species, we have to put that emotion aside and allow for just the facts of what the science tells us. Well, we'll have to see what the what the new research that the provincial government's calling for uh, shows and uh, and where they may go with this from here. Sally Cunningham, thank you for your thoughts on this. Yeah, no problem. Coming up, Tim Hortons is trying to get a bigger slice of the fast food market by adding pizza to the menu.
Welcome back. A whistleblower testified today in front of a U.S. Congressional Committee about the safety of planes manufactured by Boeing. The American company has many clients around the world, including Canada's two biggest airlines. Between them, Air Canada and WestJet fly more than 250 Boeing planes. Journalist Benji Heyer has that story. Well, this was damning from Sam Selipore. He alleges his employer is putting defective airplanes in the sky. As a quality engineer at the plane maker, he identified gaps between key sections of the fuselage of the 787 Dreamliner, which he says are not properly fastened. In other words, they could literally break apart. In front of a Senate investigations subcommittee, one of two Boeing-related hearings in Congress today alone, Mr. Salapore highlighted how shortcuts have been taken that he believes were not addressed nearly 100% of the time. He claims Boeing has, quote, no safety culture. He says he was ignored, sidelined, threatened by his superiors. He feared physical violence for going public with his concerns. And he insists all 787s should be grounded, admitting he wouldn't take his own family on one. He was joined by another whistleblower, Ed Pearson, a former manager on the 737 programme, who hit out at Boeing's actions, calling them a criminal cover-up. He told senators that Boeing illegally stopped conducting thousands of quality control inspections without the knowledge of airlines. Now, Boeing maintains that such allegations about its plane's structural integrity are, quote, inaccurate. And it's also dismissing another of the whistleblower's accusations, that workers on the factory floor were seen literally jumping on parts of the fuselage on the 777 planes to make them aligned. Boeing still faces a criminal investigation by the Department of Justice here and separate investigations by the Federal Aviation Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board. Benji Hire for CBC News, Washington. Ontario police have made arrests connected to the largest gold heist in Canadian history. It was exactly one year ago that thieves made off with about $20 million worth of the precious metal and $2 million cash from Toronto's Pearson Airport. The CBC's Marianne Demain has the latest. This was an extensive investigation, not only involving police in Canada, but also in the United States. And now one year later, at a news conference this morning, investigators revealed that they have now arrested nine people, including someone who used to work for Air Canada, as well as someone who works at a jewelry store. They also announced that they have three Canada-wide warrants for three more suspects, including someone who is a manager with Air Canada. They also revealed details on how they believe this heist was pulled off in the first place. And here's what we know. $20 million in gold bars and $2 million in foreign currency was flown in from Zurich, Switzerland to Toronto on board an Air Canada flight and then loaded into a storage facility on the afternoon of April 17th of last year. On that same afternoon, police say the suspect truck reversed into the loading dock. A fraudulent document from an unrelated delivery was printed off within Air Canada's cargo facility and was given to an attendant to access the cargo. With the help of a forklift, the golden cash were then loaded onto the truck, which then drove away. And it wasn't until that evening that Brinks, which is the security company commissioned by two Swiss banks to oversee that cargo, discovered that it was gone. Police say that given the employment information of some of the accused in this case, they believe this was an inside job. Because of their position within Air Canada, in my, in my opinion, yeah, they needed people inside Air Canada to facilitate this theft. Now, so far, 90 grand of the $20 million of pure gold has been recovered in the form of bangles. $430,000 has also been recovered along with 65 firearms. The arrests were the result of Project 24 Carat. That was a joint task force with Canadian and American law enforcement. But this is a much larger investigation because officials now also believe that this heist is connected to a weapons trafficking ring. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Explosives says it was a traffic stop in the United States. States last fall. That led to the discovery of firearms that police allege were headed to Canada and part of an international firearms trafficking ring. We believe that they've melted down the gold and then the profits they got from the gold they used to help finance the firearm, obviously purchasing the illegal firearms and that, and provide transportation and accommodation and that to get them up here. So we believe that's how the gold money has, has now kind of worked into the firearms trafficking aspect of the investigation. Police say the investigation is ongoing. Marianne Demain, CBC News, Toronto. 
Three men who took part in the 2022 blockade at the border cross crossing in Coots, Alberta, have been convicted of mischief. Alex Van Herk, Marco Van Hugenboss, and Gerard Jansen have been found guilty of one count each of mischief over $5,000. The men were accused of organizing and coordinating the COVID-19 protest that closed the border with the United States for 18 days. They could be sentenced to as many as 10 years in prison. The case is due back in court in July, and after that, they will be sentenced. One of the biggest changes announced in the new federal budget involves the taxing of capital gains. Ottawa hopes to raise tens of billions of dollars while affecting a minimum number of Canadians and businesses. The CBC's Scott Peterson explains how it will work. Quite simply, a capital gain is when you buy something, you sell at a profit, that difference will be taxed at a capital gain. Right now, only 50% of that capital gain, in effect, is taxed. And this is in order to incentivize uh, investment in, in stock and riskier assets, and that's good for the economy, and that's the reason. Here's a detail on what is going to change, starting with corporations in Canada. What used to be taxed at only 50%, now two-thirds of that capital gain for corporations will be taxed. The same goes for wealthy Canadians. Individuals will continue to pay tax on 50% on all capital gains, but anyone making over $250,000 in capital gains, two-thirds of that capital gain will be taxed. The exemption, as always, will be primary residences, but some recreational property sales for Canadians could be affected by this new tax. The new rules take effect on June the 25th, and the federal government says this will bring in close to $20 billion to its coffers over the next four years. It's also saying that uh, less than 1% of Canadians will be affected and less than 13% of corporations across Canada will be affected at the same time. But the corporate reaction and objection uh, has been swift. For example, the Canadian manufacturers and exporters said the tax measures threaten to dampen Canada's already weak investment performance and deter investment. And also the Canadian Federation of Independent Business says that higher capital gains could demotivate entrepreneurs from growing their business and a lot of business leaders as well saying that the timing is poor considering we're still looking at an uh, environment of high interest rates and uh, low economic growth. So a little bit of pushback there but nonetheless the federal government says it wants to institute these new changes as of June the 25th. Scott Peterson, CBC News, Toronto. A Russian attack has killed more than a dozen people and injured 60 in northeastern Ukraine. A missile hit several buildings, including a hospital in a densely populated city. The area has been under sustained Russian bombardment for weeks. Officials in Ukraine are calling for more aid from their international allies. The CBC's Briar Stewart has the latest. This was the moment after the initial strike. People waiting for the bus watched from a distance until a second attack forced them to dive down or try to find somewhere safer. Others never had the chance to flee in an attack that Ukraine's president contends could have been avoided if it had been supplied with more air defense systems. Officials say three Russian ballistic missiles destroyed a hotel and damaged several other buildings, including a hospital. Where people inside this clinic tried to take cover as the building shook from the force of the explosions. The attack happened just after 9 a.m. as businesses were open and children were in school. <laughs> All will be rebuilt. The worst thing is that people died, said this woman. The northeastern city of Kharkiv has come under attack several times. Ukraine's president said the military didn't have enough air defense missiles to save a major power plant that was hit near Kiev last week. People on the ground but can't help but make comparisons to the international response to Iran's attack on Israel. A lot of us felt abandoned and neglected, to be honest. Yuri Sak is an advisor to the Ukrainian government and says while the country is grateful for the support it has received, the situation is worsening. He says until recently, Ukraine was able to shoot down about 80% of enemy missiles and drones. All this time, Russia is building up their own capabilities. They are learning how to 
bypass our air defense systems. Germany, which recently announced is providing Ukraine with an additional Patriot missile system, has called on dozens of other countries to step up their support. On Friday, NATO members will be meeting to discuss how to provide more air defense systems, and that comes as the U.S. House of Representatives gets set to vote on a $60 billion aid package that has been stalled in Congress. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Tim Hortons is out to grab a fresh slice of the fast food market. The coffee chain has rolled out a new menu featuring one of the most popular foods in the world. But as Thomas Dagler shows us, it's facing some stiff competition. That Toronto Maple Leafs legend who once opened a donut shop couldn't have predicted the latest offering from the chain bearing his name. I can't wait, man. Pizza? That'll be good, right? Tim Horton's Pizza, served hot on flatbread with bacon and other toppings rolling out across Canada, with Tim's promising to install new ovens and to prepare the item in-house. When they add more stuff, uh, too much on the menu, I feel the quality goes down. Plenty has changed since the Hockey Hall of Famer himself opened this location 60 years ago. Now Tim Hortons is making a push to attract more customers later in the day and into the evening. Just ask delivery driver Kathan Parik till what time he typically makes Tim's runs. Usually it's the, just the morning orders we get from Tim Hortons. It's rarely in the afternoon. We get it at a maximum 11.30, then Tim Hortons is dead. The brand's owner faces pressure from some franchisees, complaining of lower than expected profits. But new menu items haven't always gone over well. We know you love your double doubles just the way they are. That's why we've changed things and are giving you something nobody asked for. Consider five years ago those plant-based burgers. And before that, Tim's short-lived beef lasagna casserole. Now comes stiff competition for fast food pizza. We did do a menu reduction exercise before we embarked on launching some of these new platforms and new products. Uh, and also, we sort of have a rule of one in, one out. McDonald's Canada famously tried serving pizza, but it slowed the drive through line. Tim's insists this won't do that, but... If they're unable to deliver on that quick promise, I think they have some, some potential for risk. It's another break from tradition for a multinational giant that's still considered a donut shop. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario.
For news you can trust, we have the latest on what's happening in your community and a weather forecast you can rely on no matter where you are in Atlantic Canada. I'm Amy Smith. And I'm Ryan Snodden. Join us for Atlantic tonight. Right after the National. Well, it didn't really come up in full detail earlier, but have either of you done much in your yard work? Uh, mm, yeah, I've been you looking at it. A little bit. Chipping. <laughs> Chipping Maybe. away. Oh, uh, we got some trees cut down. Okay. So I was picking up the sticks like you. So yeah. that time of year. There we go. Yeah. Kind of hope the dog will stick pick up the sticks. <laughs> right. You got a trainer Good luck for with that. that. Yeah. 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 The dog yeah. might eat the sticks. You're yeah, right. that's true. Yeah. Slowly, it becomes mulch in the lawn. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely lots of yard work still to do. Again, hopefully we'll get some uh, better, brighter weekends mm. for sure. Let's have a look at our viewer picture of the day, which shows that yes. Oh boy, there's a lot of beauty when it does rain. And of course, the sun shining there, that is a double rainbow. Second rainbow on the show tonight. Yeah. We're knocking it out of the park with the rainbow. We really are. This has got to be good luck, right? Leah from uh, <laughs> Hubley, where, the, where she took this shot. Fantastic picture. Thank you so much for sharing Ryan's picks at cbc.ca. So an isolated shower chance in the morning for the northeast. Otherwise, it's going to be a mix of sun and cloud. But, you know, the northeast part of the province will see a little bit more in the way of cloud cover tomorrow. Uh, and we will see the northerly winds still pretty pesky there. Sustained 20, 30, gusting 40, 50, even 60 along parts of the coast for Cape Breton. Uh, so, uh, yes, that is going to be a factor. Now, for Friday, we're looking at, again, some cooler temperatures in the north and east, 6, 7, 8 degrees. And then we'll be looking at a little more widespread uh, temperatures into the double digits across the south and southwest. Uh, and then that uh, weekend system will just jump right to the seven day. Rain on Saturday, but yard work day as it clears on Sunday. <laughs> yard work. We got a busy weekend ahead yeah, of us, right? Yeah. The Big Apple is now home to a big pile of plastic waste. It's in the form of an installation meant to mark Earth Day, which is just five days away. Artist Benjamin Von Wong created the sculpture to draw attention to the single use plastic pollution problem. So this art installation is inspired by the Greek legend of the Hydra, which is when you cut one head off, two more spread out. And I feel like it's very emblematic of the single-use plastic problem. We think we can solve it through recycling or cleanups, but then like another problem pops up, like, oh, we're not recycling enough. The pile includes dozens of single-use plastic containers, laundry detergent jugs, body wash containers, and lotion pump bottles. The containers are spray-painted gray and so-called tentacles with large-scale mirrors emanate from the center. The artist created the sculpture to draw attention to the single-use plastic problem and to encourage change. Bong Wong says his inspiration was Hydra, as he mentioned, that multi-headed mythical monster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.